Dawn Trail is the antithesis of Endwalker in nearly every way. Endwalker was the end of an era, the finale to a story ten years in the making, it was dark, depressing, yet came with the message of how you should cling to hope. No matter how dire things are, as long as there is even a little bit of hope, we can survive. Appreciate the small moments you get, a meal with your family. These small moments are your light in the dark. Dawn Trail is nearly the opposite. It's the beginning of something new, and is likely a self-contained story. It's bright, colorful, and so very optimistic. Even when things are at their most dire, there's a beacon of unbreakable optimism. It never reaches the same depths and the same nihilism of Endwalker. Met with some of the most polarizing opinions of any expansion, it's far from a simple topic. Late Shadowbringers and into Endwalker, we were met with a massive inundation of new players. Between the plague and the WoW exodus, the community as a whole was reshaped permanently. Old guard players, new guard players, and all opinions mixing together. Expectations of different groups clashing in what makes a good story, or what the game even is. Unfortunately, for every genuine opinion I've seen, I've seen ten times as many bad faith arguments. Rampant transphobia over the main character, blaming the Wormses for ruining the translations despite them being in charge since Shadowbringers, and so much more. It makes having any real discussion of any faults of the expansion a minefield. The moment you try to have any real talk, some bigot will co-opt the opinion and shove their garbage takes in. Whether you think so or not, death threats are not valid criticism. No game is perfect, that much is a guarantee. That includes Dawn Trail, and I have my own negative thoughts on parts of it. Ultimately though, I come out with a very high opinion of it. I would put it below Shadowbringers and Endwalker, but those two had years and years of build up to them. In long form storytelling, it's hard to put reveals and emotional beats that have hours of build up above those built up over years of emotional investment. In that sense, I'd want to put it in its own category, away from the monoliths that ended a story. Years and years of thinking about characters and events, even outside of the game, are unfair competition for characters I've just met. Yet at the same time, I keep it in the same list because Dontrail has given me my favorite characters in the entire game. I'm not going to have articles written about me and my love for them, but they quickly overtook the entire rest of the cast. Over Thancred, over Yishtola, over Graha. That's what makes seeing the bad faith criticism so hard to read. They can do so much without any buildup, completely fresh. They can go so much further with actual criticism and dealing with missteps. So I'd like to go through the expansion together, talk about my opinions, and dissect some of those criticisms that completely missed the mark. Maybe some of your honestly held opinions are going to be talked about here. In which case, I have to honestly ask you if you've played the game. Not just Dawn Trail, but all of Final Fantasy XIV. Hell, even just Endwalker, as I've seen some people levy criticisms about the expansion that exist in Endwalker, yet pretend they aren't in Endwalker, or outright true of the entire game. A criticism isn't valid when it's unevenly applied. A criticism of Final Fantasy XIV as a whole isn't a Dawn Trail criticism, no matter how much someone acts like it's a unique issue. If it exists in every expansion, it's a fault of every expansion, not just the new one. That's also to say, be civil. If you're going to start spouting bigotry as a criticism, I'm not going to suffer your existence. If insults with no substance are going to be your criticism, I'm not going to suffer your existence. If you can actually explain yourself, your reasons, so on, then it's more than likely going to let you stay in the comments. I have no problem deleting transphobes whose number one wish is to sniff Elon Musk's boots. If you like this video, please be sure to leave a rating, comment your own thoughts, maybe hit subscribe. I'm well and truly deep into working on the 1 to 100 guides, but I've been planning on something like this even before the polarizing response. If you'd like to support me even further and support those videos, I stream irregularly on Twitch and have a Patreon where I share scripts and videos early. So let's go. Let's go through my thoughts about Dawn Trail. If it wasn't obvious, this is going to contain major spoilers. This is your only warning. Before we get into the incorrect arguments people make, let's discuss one of the thoughts I had most through the entire expansion. They revealed way too much in the Fan Festival keynotes. Starting with Shadowbringers, the story of the game started to get way more surprising with what happens. Sure, there were twists, challenges, and all those good things to hope for. 
Yet for those fan fests and going into Endwalker fan fests, there was a lot more intentionally left out. They revealed Innocence, most powerful and leader of the Sin Eaters, but you kind of didn't really think much about him because it just seemed like a bog standard enemy. This was just the enemy we'd fight. Then came a very important trailer with Emmett Selk and a much more, much more significant reveal. They are gods after a fashion, yes. The eldest and most powerful of primals. Everything we'd heard, everything we'd seen, it all paled in comparison to such an earth-shattering piece of info. Sure, many people had speculated for years on the true nature of these gods, but never had any outright confirmations. Yet here it is, the truth of it all. All in a pre-release trailer. No trickery with reordering voice lines, no bait and switch, the whole honest truth. Yoshi P assured us that these reveals were minor, at least in the comparison to the full expansion. Many remained skeptical, upset they would reveal such a major thing out of nowhere, yet it was enough for many of us. Speaking personally, I forgot entirely about Innocence. Sure, I didn't literally forget, but when Vothri came out and was posed as the leader of the Sin Eaters, the most I thought was just a, huh, I thought Innocence was, guess we'll have that reveal later. Didn't question the idea that Vothri was himself Innocence, something much more was afoot. I was prepared for any number of crazy reveals. Then we finally beat Innocence, the Exarch's identity is confirmed, and... We chase him to the bottom of the ocean, desperate to save Graha, and get some answers only to have a far more questions. The windowing on revealing Amarat, the nature of the world, the ancients, and who Emmet Selk is. An entire expansion of constantly distrusting him and all he said? The proof is right in front of our eyes. He did not lie to us. We had other reveals, other plot points to hit our hearts, but every interaction with Emmet during the entire expansion was granted new weight in Amarat. To end on the implications of us rejoining with Ardbert and Emmet recognizing our original ancient self, even without the further reveals of 5.3, the truth of Azem the Traveler. Then Endwalker, simply put, the entire expansion? Our revealed foes for Endwalker were the Mega Sisters and Anima. Okay, we'll fight those as trials for the Allied Society Primals, and what do you mean they're just dungeon bosses? If Anima, the main summon of one of the most popular Final Fantasy games, is just a dungeon boss, what the hell is our first trial? Oh. So then Dawn Trail, we're getting a reset. Things aren't going to be as dire as the last two expansions. We're going for a bit of a vacation, but still gonna have stakes. But what's with this weird spoiler cover? Why so coy about this? Oh, it's Solution 9. What Solution 9 is, obviously we're gonna get some big reveal and all that. It's gonna be some big surprise and... Oh, they've now told us it's Alexandria. They didn't tell us what the Golden City was, what Solution 9's true nature is, but they revealed most of the answer. Contrary to Shadowbringers, where them being primals is a small part of a much bigger picture. Plus, that reveal was in the final trailer. Most of what they showed for Dawn Trail wasn't even in that final live letter, but the fan fests. When stakes are so much lower, when we're not fighting a universe-destroying threat, smaller reveals are relatively larger, because the larger reveals are relatively smaller. We're not dealing with the true nature of everything that exists anymore, only the nature of Tyrol and Alexandria. Alexandria has big implications for all worlds, but Sveen's plans with living memory aren't even close to what Medion was causing. Said living memory is the true nature of the Golden City. We get crumbs and clues to what it is, only for the answers to all be given at the end. The shock and surprise of living memory is huge, but I couldn't say the same for Solution 9. Knowing Final Fantasy 9, I know a lot of what kind of crazy stuff might be involved. Then there's that people quickly translated the signs that mentioned soul transfers and such. Sure, Sphine's nature is a surprise, Heritage Found being a small bubble of another shard is still a big reveal, and so on. But we already knew they existed. You lose a lot when you know ahead of time. I would have been so much more excited to not know Alexandria was here, to not know Solution 9 existed at all. They revealed way too much this time around, 
It's not like they didn't want to have surprises because living memory exists, but knowing Solution 9 was around the corner made my expectations through the expansion change. After Shadowbringers and Endwalker, we needed a brighter, happier story. So when we complete the Rite of Succession and Smile begins to play, we think that this really was a vacation expansion. Yet when I got there, I'm shouting over and over how this is too happy that I know there's more. Solution 9 is about to show up and ruin everything for everyone. I was right, because I was told it was going to happen. Lying by omission has served the team greatly for the previous two expansions. Picking and choosing what is revealed seemed to be something they were experts at. Yet when the stakes are being kept lower, they fumble and reveal too much. Simultaneously, they lied by... lying. The way they framed the expansion is very, very unlike what we got. To me, what was being sold was like, One Piece? I'm no One Piece fan, but I expected something much different when we're getting told our allies are divided. No, they're not. They're only divided as far as the Science of the Seventh Dawn split up after Endwalker. We just end up back together constantly because, I mean, look what happens. Graha is holding the fort. Yustola is forever trying to get back to her husband on the first. Estinian is a vagrant always and forever, though I kind of take a lot of umbrage with Estinian. He shows up to be awesome in fighting Galul Jaja, then vanishes. He then shows up again in Shaloni to interrupt the one kid and then basically vanishes again until Solution 9 shows up. Like, it's cool he's here, but he's kinda also not. I feel like it would have been way cooler had he not shown up for even a moment in Shaloni. That nobody even knows who he is when he shows up to help in the climactic battle against Saral Jaz invasion. He really does just disappear because he's just doing his own thing and not just filling an appearance quota. I like Estinian and that he does his own thing, but if he's gonna do his own thing, let him do his own thing. Then when the dome appears, the invasion appears, he comes out to help because he does have that protective spirit in him. He's already barely there? Tie it back into his character. Make him appear even less. This leaves only Thancred and Orianger as actual competition. Yet it's pretty quickly apparent we're not going to be at odds. They constantly tease at it, tease at even just a friendly battle between us. Yet none of this ever actually comes even close to happening. It's quickly established that Kona, while being autistically hyperfixated on Charlie and technology, is a good guy. He's just kind of short-sighted at times. He genuinely cares for his people, but is so stuck in his head that he just puts the cart before the squid. This is who Thancred and Oriange are partied with. So if things come to blows, it's not going to be in any sort of antagonistic way. We're not split equally among the four claimants, where each one has a belief that each scion gets behind for their own reasons. That they will fight each other in a true belief that their claimant has the best path forward for Toral or something. Imagine that, the Scions no longer united under a common banner, their individual beliefs and attitudes able to shine forth more. No ill will against each other, but truly a contest between Scions. Instead, it's just those two with Kona, mentoring him to help his social skills, something most of us probably wish we had. The worst part of this is the dungeon into the cutscene right after. In the dungeon, Thancred causes a cave-in so that we have to take a detour. We never slap him afterwards for this, but this is also the one and only time we were pitted against each other. As much as I loved that part, even the Iron Chef feet put us in the same team. Yet there's an entire voiced cutscene about us fighting them. There's so many scenes this expansion I felt should have been voiced but weren't, likely because of the people who keep incorrectly stating that only cutscenes have plot important info, make everything plot important a cutscene, even if most scenes aren't voiced as a result. Yet they chose this one of all scenes, a scene that is misdirection, which, slight tangent, don't compare the percentage of unvoiced cutscenes to voiced scenes, but the amount of voiced scenes overall. How many lines of dialogue are spoken across every expansion? That's the amount you need to be comparing. If there are 30 voiced scenes with 3,000 voiced lines, and that's a consistent value, then it's not an issue of less. I've seen so many people compare the wrong numbers, or only half the numbers. 10% of Dawn Trail versus the same number of lines as Shadowbring has had, for example, I do not personally have these numbers, are two very different stories. It's one of those moments of someone is making a point 
so poorly, you feel like you're defending what should rightly be criticized. Anyway, back to the main topic. Like, yeah, sure, these two stand absolutely no chance against us because not much does. They could put up a fight though, and there could have been some kind of two versus one situation. Something for us to actually fight each other, even as friendly competition like the Galul Jaw Jaw fight. Maybe this is some cheeky nod to what we'll do in the patch content? They'll want to spar as a solo duty? Maybe as some kind of show to forge ties between Tuliolol and Solution 9? But like, they set it up and didn't actually do it. There was no being divided. In the end, we're both doing the exact same thing, just with two different people. Especially with how much Kona loves his sister. I have never understood whenever people are saying the characterization is poor. The characterization is immaculate. Everyone acts as I expect they would. The issue was a lack of using the characterization. It's not poor if it doesn't even exist. It's a lack of it. Alphano and Red Alphano are here for very explicit reasons with helping Garlemald and expanding their diplomatic knowledge. Thancred and Orianche are absolutely the mentoring type. Especially after Reen? The issue was a lack of characterization, not the characterization we got. The Scions being here in Tyrol? Mostly pointless. Getting diplomatic ties to Radzatan? Really cool moment for Alphano, and just really cool for Vitra to come swooping in. I love Ajdaya hanging with Kona. This is the best thing. When our characters are allowed to be, they do cool stuff. The characterization is exactly as I'd expect them. It's okay for us to have an expansion without the Scions. They can introduce a whole company of new characters or have the Scions around but just around. Tyrol is this new place to explore. While we go to help Wuklamat, everyone else is just having a vacation, learning the culture, and so on. Istinian is here just because that's Istinian. But the way it goes, it's like trying to have cake and eat it too. People have constantly said we have too much Wuklamat, when if the Scions weren't even around, would they be able to say that? The problem isn't too much Wook, the problem is not using the characters they did bring. You can have both, since the entire point of the expansion, learning about the cultures and many things tied to that, is directly a part of the Scion identity. We've been doing that for the entire game as a matter of course, rather than the focus itself. So let everyone be more involved than a singular cooking competition. Give us moments of Alice and Blue Alice questioning the cultures and trading with how they could apply it to Garlemald. With Thancred and Orianger mentoring Kona, give us more of that. At the end, Thancred and Orianger just randomly show back up to fight Zoralja. Instead of just sending them away, have a scene where they're about to venture off and Kona asks them to stay a bit longer for more mentoring on other things. As much as people keep saying she stole screen time, that's not how writing works. The character didn't reach out to the screen and go, Hey, Yoshi P, go make the writing team take all of half in those lines in the first half of the expansion and give them to me. Because here, let me put a picture of Wuklamod on the screen. And next to her, let's have a picture of Kryle. Whoa, would you look at that. Both characters are on the screen. Both characters are getting screen time and Wuklamod isn't starting to take over. Whoa, would you look at that. And then I could have them start talking to each other and... Wait, Wuklamot is growing. She's... she's taking over the screen. Oh no, she's taking all of Kral's screen time! Oh, what have I done?! But seriously, they actually do this in the story. I'm showing this cutscene a lot in this video because it contains so many of the points I want to show. We have Wuklamot and Kral talking about their lack of parents, but how they see their adoptive parents as real parents anyway. The talk between Kona and his team. They could do this so much more. Wuklama outright calls us a mentor. Why not also Kryol? Have the pair develop a deeper kinship too. She thanks everyone constantly for their help, but only us as her mentor. Would it also potentially slow the story down? Yes. But much as what people are asking for, there are too many characters for everyone to have their fair share. The expansion's length is not infinite. My proposed new not Scion characters would have to be minor characters rather than full main characters. Namika, but a battle warden seeking to help Wuklamot. You could even use the minor characters we did get. Zekoa's side plot takes up so much time with the payoff being Namika's bracelet. There could have been a tear-jerking scene where she receives it, 
is thanked for being such a wonderful mother or something. I'll come visit you in Yasulani. And then boom, the dome. But since we have Zekawa here, he'd fit for a minor character who ends up helping. As it stands, this was a huge wasted plot point beyond the idea of this is the kind of thing the Warrior of Light does. Putting every blame on a character that can't dictate how the game is made is extremely telling, especially when they had all possible excuses to have Wook share the spotlight far more often, to interact with each other far more often. The Warrior of Light doesn't need to be her only mentor. Our entire party has things to offer, and it would have been interesting to see that happen. Mentoring, though? Mentoring is an important role. I've kind of been one for the past five years with making my guides. Whether I agree with it or not, many call me the best of the creators, king, goat, the only reason they're able to play the game at even a decent level. I am a mentor to many people. Sometimes it's thankless, sometimes the thanks oversells me, but it's an important job. Mentoring is something it seems people have a problem with. Mentoring people is often extremely difficult. Doing something as heroic as passing on your knowledge as an adventurer isn't as simple as talk about the topic. You have to explain it in a way that can be digested, especially when it comes to emotional mentoring. Conceptually, this might be one of the hardest tasks we've been given. It's no save the universe, but not everyone can teach. Yet the issue is that it's not cool and awesome enough with us being the center of attention. One of the biggest complaints I've seen for Final Fantasy XIV's story is quite literally that we aren't the focus of the expansion. This isn't something unique to Dawn Trail, but a complaint as old as A Realm Reborn. When I see people complaining about the story of A Realm Reborn, it's often filled with complaints about how we aren't the focus enough. People should recognize how special we are. These are both veterans and brand new players alike, asking why hot singles in their area don't immediately know that the explicitly secret society of the Scions has a new member that killed God? Was A Realm Reborn focused on the Warrior of Light? This one can be argued either way. This follows our journey to become the Warrior of Light, only officially becoming one at the end of 2.0. The patch content, meanwhile, takes a very sharp focus on everything but ourselves. Considering this, how people tend to talk about A Realm Reborn, and how much 2.0 is focused on world building, I'd lean with no. A Realm Reborn is not about us. We just coincidentally are waddling through interesting times. Was Heavensward focused on the Warrior of Light? Absolutely not. The most about us specifically is how we are regaining the Blessing of Light. But this happens incidentally as we fight to figure out what is happening with the Dragon Song War. We're learning about Ishgard and the dragons as we travel through both lands. We stop the war, but the story is about that war and both parties involved. More focus is put on House Fortomph and Harshifont than the entirety of our Blessing of Light scenes. When the curtain falls on 3.3, we see Count Fortomph closing the book on his memoirs since the entire expansion was told from the point of view of said memoirs. Did Stormblood focus on the Warrior of Light? Not even close. This was about Lise, Alamigo, and Doma. Xenos takes an interest in us personally, but that's about it for how the plot is about us. That's more plot of Xenos than us anyway. Why is he so interested in our strength? We know why we're strong, all the stuff we've gone through, etc. These experiences influence our decisions, like in the amazing patch scene with Fordola. But these patches are about her and Yotsuyu. Did Shadowbringers focus on the Warrior of Light? No, it was focused on Reen, Ardbert, the first as a location, and Emmett Selk. Our involvement is quite literally a means to an end for both the Exarch and Emmett. They know how strong we are, and the Exarch has a deep affinity for us after the Crystal Tower raids. The plan isn't about us though, we're quite literally the weapon pointed at the Sin Eaters. The end goal was for the Exarch to take all the light for himself, and disappear to save the first. The first actual point of Shadowbring is actually being about us personally, is when we step into Amara. Before this point, Emmett only was interested in us as humanity and if we could care for the star. Only now do we have the shade of Hythlodeus implying there's more to our presence, and the hallucination Hades has before the final fight. Things fully become about us with 5.3 and the reveal that we are Azem, that we are shards of one of the Convocation, that Emmett may have had a deeper reason for playing along with us. 
Even then, 5.4 and 5.5 .5 was more about setup of the Talaferoi. Generally, we're still just the unstoppable force that moves the story along. Endwalker was the first and only time we were made the main focus of the story, and even then that's arguably untrue. The world unsundered of the final days are the plot focus. We learn more about Medion than anything about us. This is partly intentional for players to apply their own headcanon. Who was Azam? Besides eccentric, that's up to you to decide. I'll give you this one though, just to be nice. That and because this promptly ended with the patch content, where we stopped being the focus again. The 13th and 0 are our focus. We're there just to keep having adventures, coincidentally stopping Golbez and his plot. We're the driving force because we're a walking arsenal, not because the story is about us. This has always been true and will always be true. Again, this lack of focus is one of the biggest complaints I've seen time and time again. The focus is so far off of us, nobody knows who we even are. Before we become a hero, we're just some random nobody. After our deeds are known, not our face. Mikote number 37 is hardly notable in Eorzea, and the game focuses on the people hearing of these deeds rather than us. The Scions are a secret society known only by the Grand Companies and select other allies. Who we are is a secret until the Rising Stones plot point. We are the main character, make no mistake. But many games have main characters that are not the focus. Most Zelda games are not about Link beyond him being the reincarnation of the hero. Persona games are not about the fool. They're the leader of the group, but for as much as the games are built on your interactions and connections to people, you aren't the focus. There's a big difference between being a main character and the focus. I would say the Scions are also all main characters. And then we come to Dawn Trail. Dawn Trail is about Wuklamat, Arnville, and Kryl. Yet Dawn Trail has done a lot to paint the Warrior of Light as more than just some random dude. Even the world unsundered thought us just a familiar of Azem at first. NPCs like Bakul Jaja must have gotten visits from their baby girl long before the story happened because he can tell with just a look that we are not to be messed with. Taking Hun Maruk hostage is not just a matter of getting one over on Wuklamat. It's to keep you out. But cool Jaja is so afraid of you, he takes a hostage to ensure you stay out of it. It's not just a matter of Wook Lamott wanting to stand on her own, it's a matter of the game for once giving people exactly what they asked for. Recognize how absolutely awesome we are, so awesome we're too strong for most things to have any tension. You don't go to the far edge of fate only to lose to some random with no actual titles of his own. There's a reason one of the dialogue options is outright, the scary adventurer won't do anything. To be sidelined implies that isn't where we always have been. We're a bench warmer and sent out to hit back-to-back -back home runs when the going gets tough. Or when Galul Jaja asks for a duel because he's like us or Xenos, a glutton for battle and adventure. This is the only outright characterization we've been given, on purpose. Enough so that the plot can still involve us and be moved forward by us. The reasons we go on these adventures are for us as players to decide. And so now we're a mentor. We have a direct effect on teaching the nation's next leader, not just helping current leaders or restoring nations to their peoples. We're directly electing a brand new leader to this nation. Everyone sees how immensely awesome we are and how fuck off scared they are of us. But the problem is we're not the main character in a game it never felt like we were the main character for. Whether you like that the game has us as the main focus or not, that's fine. Pretending it is only an issue for Dawn Trail is something I can never agree with. Final Fantasy XIV has always been us going on adventures, helping people, and learning about them on the way. Whether you buy into the role-playing of this role-playing game, the vast majority of things about you is completely up to you. How deeply you were hurt by Harshafon's death, whether you remember that the Ancients once lived and try to spread their story. Being a Zem, being important, is not the same thing as being the focus. A Realm Reborn's base game literally ends on the power of friendship, and Walker's base game ended on the power of friendship. The game has never been subtle for the overarching narrative, and after Endwalker, you really have to not be paying attention to have 
any inclination otherwise. Azem is left a complete mystery. We have deeds they have done, a level of canonical gremlin that applies to both them and our Warrior of Light, and not much else. Whether your character has fallen for another is left to you. Whether you stay in Tyrol after Dawn Trail as far as story goes, that's up to you. The devs making Wook Lamont fall in love with you would be the stupidest idea. Who you are, what you are besides Azem, is up to you. Unfortunately for you, what we saw in Endwalker, Azem is the mentoring type. If you're so stuck in having main character syndrome, then maybe you need to take a second look at Xenos. You're acting more like him than Azem. The longer things go on, the more it rings true that people dislike Xenos because they see themselves in him, constantly seeking the validation of the Warrior of Light. Let's talk characters. There's some big hit and misses in the expansion. The main success is Wook Lamont and her family. They go a little hard into joking every time a boat is involved in how Wook gets motion sickness, but even that gets some great moments. The fact that even alpacas are a problem for her is hilarious consistency. Her asking to hold your hand for the balloon to Yachtel is a great moment of growth. She's trying to be rid of her false bravado. But speaking of Yachtel, we then find out that as a child, she was dropped into a cenote, a high fall, nearly drowning. Now, I don't know if that's something that can actually cause motion sickness in reality, but this is a world teeming with magic and ether, and the medias that make the cenotes are explicitly extra magical. With how her alpaca fear is also a childhood trauma point, this sounds intentional and makes me go, oh wow, what? On the other end, the kind of people you expect to hate someone as optimistic as Wuklamot aren't exactly the kind of people hating her. Some of the most asinine takes that ignore the entire plot of Dawn Trail and often the entire game. She's naive, so are Kona and Zeralja. Even Galul Jaja tells you this explicitly with no subtext. The game literally openly says she's naive, says she is not ready to lead. That's the entire purpose of the Rite of Succession. Prepare them to lead, and if none of them come out ready, none of them will lead. You can't really call this a problem when it's part of her and Kona's character growth, which does happen. Then when she does become Dawn Servant, she brings Kona along to cover her weaknesses, the head of reason to her resolve. She's not super smart, but she loves her people and would go to any length to protect them. She tries too hard to befriend her enemies, so the fact she doesn't say make Tyrol great again and put a hit out on the aggressive Yakui faction is a flaw now? There's some issue with how stuff like the Mamuk plotline resolves, but like, why is not committing a war crime somehow a flaw? You really think Zoralja is the good guy here? Understanding begets fellowship. Even if there is no way both sides can come to a compromise, she must first understand them and why a compromise can't be reached. Better to try than to just jump right to murder. Hell, even Emmett Selk himself did this. Emmett let us kill the Light Wardens when he could have killed us immediately. He knew the Exarch was planning something, but let it happen. Testing us to find a compromise and common ground, even if the inevitable was conflict. And then when it becomes Solution 9, she isn't quick to befriend? Sure, she sees Sveen as a ruler who truly cares about her people, a literal fact that is directly told to you and is completely true, but she doesn't trust her. We team up with Oblivion, whom we also do not fully trust. Wook is putting her faith in Aranville that Kafkiwa is who she says she is. Hell, the literal first thing Wook Lamont does is threaten to kill Sveen. People hated Xenos because they saw themselves in him, and once again the point gets proven. Not everyone is looking for conflict. Trying to find a peaceful solution where one exists is a very normal thing to do. Yet when push comes to shove, she's right there to put a stop to things. Violence not being her first option isn't a flaw, when once again, her main story stated goal is peace. She doesn't get punished by the narrative. No. <laughs> also, why do you want that? Why does every character need to be miserable? Why can't some people be happy? We just had an entire expansion about misery and the inevitability of death. 
let's come out the other side and see a brighter tomorrow. Every NPC being written the exact same way is the opposite of good writing you're hoping for. It's like Zeno says in Endwalker, would you really be happy if he had a reason for what he does? Would you really be happy if every single NPC comes with a tragic backstory that colors their entire personality? Her biggest issues are naivete and lacking confidence. The fact she's from Ikbrash is backstory, but doesn't really mean much for who she is beyond her motion sickness. Galul Jaja is her father. She never went back to Ikbrash for that reason. Tuliolol is her home, her family. The tragic backstory is for her biological father, rather than her. And that's fine, she doesn't need one, not everyone needs one, especially when we get plenty of those in this expansion from Bakul Jaja and Zeral Ja. Hell, even Kona. Her VA can't emote. Come on. Come on. Take it. There's definitely some spots where the lines do not fit the scene. Mostly that first line in the final battle. Sting. Listen to me. But I really feel like this is an issue with the recording studios and directors. There's inconsistencies in other places too. Walk straight into a cenote. A cenote? Cenote. Which way do you say Cenote? I'm more prone to go with Arnville with him being native to Tural, but cenote. is a real word. It's not something made up. So when two voiced characters back to back say it differently, if it was two different natives saying it differently, that would make sense. But Alice has never heard it before, so she should say it how Arnville said it, right? But again, it'd be different from two different natives. While growing up, I've heard my hometown pronounced three different ways, my first name pronounced three different ways, and my last name too. This isn't from people across the nation, it's all from people native to my hometown. So it isn't a regional dialect, there's no steamed hams, just people pronounce things differently. In this case though, she's heard one possible way to say it. It's not like rolling her R's is something she has issues with or an example like that. It's just two different ways of saying it. Also, what the hell is with Yustola here? If I didn't know better, I'd say you're enjoying yourself. This isn't a recording mistake. This is part of the actual voice line. I recorded it two different times. If I didn't know better, I'd say you're enjoying yourself. Apparently due to personal reasons, her VA was always going to have some poor audio, but it's not like this isn't the job of audio technicians to mitigate. Along with audio balancing, which it seems a lot of people are complaining about. That's not up to the VAs to fix, that's on the audio techs to do. To be fair, audio balancing is really hard. I struggle with it all the time. I am not being paid as a professional audio tech though. I'm always trying to improve my editing, but that isn't the main job description. Otherwise, Wook is great to listen to normally, very pleasant to hear. The accent is very fun. It makes the hiccups extremely weird and jarring because we can hear proper emoting. It's not a matter of can't, she just didn't in these cases. If a different performance was called for, let's make sure those directions are given. People seem to not realize that the reason voice acting is the way it is, is largely due to direction. Lines with no context, even with being told to yell, does not mean you will get the delivery that fits the scene. Yelling can be many things. Happy yelling to someone across the way. Angry yelling. Threatening yelling. Yelling in itself is nothing. Games aren't voiced in order typically. So context is key. Or do you want to tell me Amerix's voice actor is also terrible and awful and the worst for this performance where he seems to not at all be concerned that Horshafont just got impaled? Father, please. Why must you do this, father? Lord Horshafont. And I highly doubt this came with death threats too, despite it being arguably worse than the worst Wook Lamott line. And just so we're clear, nobody should be getting death threats. She randomly gets a power boost, Mary Sue. The message, the last however many quests you've done, has been that she just needs to find her confidence, that she already had strength deep down, she just needed to believe in herself. The entire first half of the expansion is 
constantly showing her flaws. False bravado. Weaker than Zoroja. Not just less smart than Kona, but actually kinda dumb. Huge levels of imposter syndrome and lacking confidence. She doesn't get stronger, she gets confidence to carry herself. She doesn't get smarter, she needs Kona to be the smart one. Again, she cannot handle this alone. She needs Kona to handle the things she can't. She is no head of reason. She is the head of resolve. She resolves to stay true to her beliefs, to want to protect Tarol. She's learned to recognize her faults, but not wallow in those faults. People complain so much about how slow the first half of the expansion is, way faster than the garbage of the first half of Shaloni, and yet the expansion went by so fast that three and a half zones worth of growth were completely missed by these people. Four zones when you consider the people who act like she's learned nothing before becoming Dawn Servant. A lot of the criticism levied at the expansion are the most contradictory since like, her being too dumb to be a leader and she's a Mary Sue are directly opposed. These aren't even different people in most cases, it's people saying both are true. A Mary Sue would be a perfect leader with no problems. Everyone loves her, believes in her, and will support her. Meanwhile, that's the opposite of the truth. The boat ride to Tyrol poses her as an underdog. The introduction of the claimants? Everyone leaves before she comes out because explicitly people don't believe in her. She has her supporters, but the populace at large doesn't even consider Wuklamot an option. They are surprised she is a claimant at all. The entire first Urkel Pacha section, you run into NPCs who explicitly don't believe in you. The saddle seller is so against her, they double the saddle price. She starts naive like all of her family, growing out of it without discarding her ideals. She literally says the line, is peace simply the absence of war? The game explicitly is telling you her views are changing without discarding the whole thing. A change of view, a change of person, is not going from one viewpoint to an exact opposite viewpoint. Not that you'd be happy if she did change that much, the game told you in what way she's changing and you couldn't figure it out. Which for all the issues that come along with Sveen herself, the reading comprehension takes the biggest dive here. She doesn't trust Sveen, only trusts Kafkiwa because of Arinville, and is here to kill her brother. She's willing to do what needs to be done. She's willing to stop those who will get in the way of that peace. She just doesn't put killing as her first option. She wants to try and find a compromise. At most, she mistakenly believes Sveen that she didn't want the attack on Tarol. One lie in an otherwise non-stop truth session? Believing a lie and trusting someone are not the same thing. Almost just like Emmett Selk, for all of Shadowbringers, even if you entirely believed every word out of his mouth, did you trust him? I believed him, but didn't trust him. Weaving in a lie where everything else was true would have been no different. When it comes to her still trying to talk Sveen out of it, I'll go over that when I talk about living memory as a whole. To sum it up, a lot of the things people say about Wuklamot are either outright wrong or outright explained in the story. It's not like you have to like her or that she's a perfectly written character. For all that I like about her, she really does constantly repeat her line about peace. The fact that what that peace is is changing through the story just isn't also repeated. Believe it. I'm just tired of reading things that are quite literally contradicted by the text of the story. The fact that she has flaws is also not some bad thing. I really hope they don't start actually writing Mary Sue's going forward, since that seems to be what people are going to lead the devs toward. I worry because the comparison Yoshi P used in an interview is Alphano, the single most hated character in A Realm Reborn. People despise his confidence, his demeanor, everything about him in A Realm Reborn. It's only after he's humbled that people start to like him. Alpha No 2 is starting from a negative point, because confidence is directly what causes the issues to begin with. He's full of himself, and the idea that this is a positive trait is very worrying. The only other protagonist that starts with some sort of emotional hangup that drives their character is Reen. 
Lee's too if you don't count the two expansions they spent pretending she was Eda. Everyone else starts confident and suffers setbacks, if they suffer a setback at all. Yustola casting flow causes her to lose her eyesight, a fact that rarely if ever comes up. Which apparently the real bad translation work is with Heavensward, where the original script just says ether sight is only going to tire her out, not slowly kill her. She otherwise hasn't changed or grown as a character at all. I mean, she became a black mage, I guess. For all my joking, her interest in interdimensional travel is likely just for the scholarly pursuits, not actually because she wants to go back to Runar. We'll have to see what we end up doing with the key. So when your best example is Alphano, while everyone's favorite is simply waifu bait, the problem isn't Wuklamot or that she was written with flaws, it's that she's an outlier. Then Grid ends up nearly becoming a Gary Stu after 2.0, picks up the ninja fighting style just by watching the domains work, is still the best rogue in the world even after Flo removes his ability to channel Aether. His stealth capabilities rival the domains too. Then finally in Shadowbringers do we get a major focus on him with his relationships with Minfilia and Reen. His downfall in 2.0 is that he was trying too hard, though that's a bit reductive of a summary. People don't just run into setbacks, their lives up to that point are part of who they are. It's not a tragic backstory, but it still is an important one. She's the youngest child in a family of pure talent. Galul Jaja united the nation and apparently kept it so peaceful that the final days didn't even make an impact. Zeral Ja is insanely strong on his own, made captain of the Lands Guard. Kona was gifted and ended up studying in Charlian. Shock Taral is basically his testing ground. To once again use the metaphor, we have our heads of resolve and reason. There is no head of peace, even if that's ultimately what Wuklamot takes after her father. No shit she developed a complex. She might actually be a Mary Sue if she managed to come out of that family without one. In that aspect, Wuklamot is probably the most realistic character in the entire game. She's not a perfectly written character, but being written with flaws that she has to contend with is not the issue people think it is. I meanwhile love this family, and if I played more into the RP aspect of the game, I almost certainly would headcanon that he stays in Taral. This is his home now, with Kona and Lama Chi. Galul Ja too if he comes to live in Tuliolo. On the flip side though, we have our other main characters. Arinville and Cryo really got a short end of the stick. Hell, the expansion is told from Arinville's perspective and he feels like he got cut short. No matter how much of the patch content focuses on him, which it won't given there's a ton of plot points left unresolved. They constantly tease Kryle's plot points for the entire expansion, but it still feels like they kind of didn't focus on it at all. We get the big reveal that her parents are from the Golden City, and then meet those parents in the Golden City. The actual development involved feels far more like developing the Lollafell tribe that escaped and her parents than Kryle. It's great she gets her bit of happiness, time to bond with her parents. She gets dragged along the rest of the time, She's just there because, I mean, she's here to get answers. Answers she's just following along and ends up getting. Mostly coincidentally, it feels like. Obviously, it's not that blatant. That's a bit of an exaggeration. But I'm far from the only person who feels there's something off about this being a Kryle expansion and how little she actually got. Like I proposed, her becoming friends with Wuklamat could tie into things. It's clear Galul Jaja was close with Galuf, so do it again with this generation. She gets her answers and I absolutely love that she takes Maya as a name proudly, but it's just kind of a side thing until living memory. Great character moments, but the development of the character just feels secondary. Orinville, I think it might just be we all collectively just hate what he goes through, because we actually do learn a bit about him. Being our guide and having such close ties to Wuklamat, his personality and connections shine through. He's a native to Tyrol, so in a sort of way he did make it home, and we're learning about his home the entire time. When we hit Shaloni, the start of the weaker half of the expansion, we start to really dive into Orinville when we're not dealing with dumb pointless cowboys. We get acquainted with an old friend and learn a bunch from her. It's only now that it starts to be driven home that his mentor is his mom. We learn his real name and seem to converse for quite a while after. Through Heritage Found, we see he's actually shocked and even afraid at what is going on. This was his home, now it lies in ruins, the people all gone. 
When you run into Oblivion and Kafkiwa is among them, you can tell he's a bit more calm. It's at least better than things were, a small bit of relief. He can tell that this is, in fact, his mom, but things aren't right. It's only when we defeat Zoralja and make it to living memory does the truth come out. Kafkiwa isn't endless. She's been dead for years. Orinville lost the one bit of relief he had in the loss of his home. He spends the entire zone despondent, forced to confront this fact in the final section, a truth he has been trying to ignore since he accidentally discovered it. He doesn't want to say goodbye. It seems clear the game wants to point that Kafkiwa truly cared and loved her fussy little bun bun, but the way he chides her at the end really struck me. You're doing it again. Deciding everything by yourself, and then disappearing. Every time I think of Kafkiwa, I think of this line. This feeling overwhelms me. It's a feeling I know too well, with, again, ringing louder and louder every time. Perhaps it's just my own traumas and feelings overtaking everything, but I related too much to Orinville here. The game clearly wants her to be a loving mother, but I can't help but hate her, resent her for how she's acting. He's not just reserved, he has a well of emotion deep down, yet it seems he's forced to choke it down in some vague sense of growth. Does she even know how much it tears me apart? It's an emotional feeling far too complex for me to even explain. So I'll simply messily summarize the feeling thusly. It's the feeling that she's forcing him and not allowing him to grieve. Death is inevitable. There's no point in grieving over that loss. Dawn Trail as a whole has a huge focus on grief and her ambivalence just hurts. Encouraging to grow and expand horizons is one thing. Discounting grief is another. In the end, Arnville doesn't get the answers he was looking for. Perhaps that is the message they are going for with all of this. Sometimes we don't get answers. Life is never that easy. Not everything has an answer. We have gotten answer after answer to so many things in this game. We'll get so many more answers. But the answers Arnville seeks? He'll never get them. Orinville is our guide. We get lots of personal interaction with him, seeing what kind of person he is, and even some of his weakness. But deep down, he's here to go home. He wants to see his home, even if he's too proud to admit it at times. Yet he never does. He will never go home again. It gets trapped in the dome, and rots away from the thunderous blight surrounding it. The people, the buildings, gone. Some may still live, far more aged as they are. His mother too, is already gone replaced with an AI copy that simply acts just like her. Kryle too wants to go home, even for a moment, know who she is, why she is here. She's not looking for confidence or doubting herself, she wants to know her history, and above all, know her parents. She can't go home either. Living memory is just that, a living memory of who they were. What she gets is fleeting. A seeker of knowledge, she would want to know so much more. As quick as they meet, they already have to say goodbye. There is no home. They are only the memories of that home. All they can hope for is closure. They can hope for one more day. A joyous one, if they could choose. Let's talk about Sveen in specific for a moment. People generally see her as boring, but I have stuff about her that ties into my final living memory topic. For now, let's focus on what she represents. She has this friendly face. Everyone loves her, yet her goals are blatantly evil. I've seen some people compare it to colonialism and yeah, they're right. Colonial art has its own sphene, has its own justifications of why this was good and not at all terrible to the people that were harmed. A commentary on the evils people would do if you dress it up enough. This is just one reading, one that I thought a lot of if I'm including it here. She's the counterpart to Wook Lamott. Both would do anything for their people, but Sveen's is far more sinister in nature. Sveen is what people complain Wook isn't. Killing is the first solution. Even more interesting to me is what Alexandria and Living Memory represent. It's explicitly an inversion of Yakui ideals and an opposing ideal of Wook Lamott herself. In the Yakui beliefs, a person only dies when they are forgotten. 
that as long as there is ever someone who remembers they exist, at least know they once existed, they are still alive. Remember. Remember us. Remember that we once lived. When I think of how the Yakui see things, I think of all things Technoblade. I don't know how or why, but one day my YouTube recommendation suggested The Great Potato War, a series of three videos about a silly little competition he had with another player in the Hypixel Minecraft server. I hadn't watched or seen anything Minecraft related in years. It just showed up on its own. It was hilariously edited, commentated, and just generally the perfect kind of thing to watch. He's excited and enthusiastic without going full, what's up gamers? He's just genuinely this fun guy. I was captivated the whole time. So when the finale ended, I looked over in the recommended to see something else. A video titled, So Long Nerds. The man I just watched have a funny little war over potatoes was already gone. Taken far too soon due to disease. And yet, he is here. I just watched him. He just entertained me with Minecraft in a way I'd never been entertained before. He was just here, right? I can't claim to know what his family went through, how they laid him to rest, the grief they must have felt, but for millions? His grave is right here. The glyphs of his channel, the thumbnails of each video. Technoblade never dies, because he's right here. Even if YouTube were to suddenly shut down right now, he would still be here for a very long time, living on in the hearts and minds of those who remember him. The pain still rips through those who truly miss him, but Techno lives on with them. Now, what would happen if tomorrow, we all woke up, and nobody remembered who Technoblade was? Instead of remembering him, all our memories of him were taken to make a perfect, exact replica of him. A replica so accurate, that even Kafkiwa's insatiable appetite for adventure got her to leave. We'll know the concept of our memories being stored somewhere, but not who or what those memories were. Only those absolutely closest to him might know something is missing. We'll never see this replica, nor know these replicas exist. But they're alive. They're real. If you did meet them, you'd not be able to tell the difference. Alexandria is the Yakui ideals taken literally. The memories that make up the Endless make them alive. To Sphine, these people are still alive. You can meet them, talk to them, and they act just like their original lives. They simply moved away, and you can't remember them. I've seen a lot of people discounting living memory and what it represents beyond just, they're not real. That shutting living memory down means nothing. That no, none of this is real. Yet look back on what the entire expansion has been about. Learning about different cultures, how their beliefs are not inherently something in the way of progress or anything else. How would the people of Alexandria feel about this? They didn't know about the Endless, and they would die soon after starting to doubt how Sphine never ages. This might even be something we run into with the patch content. The aftermath of the Endless, and the fact that we've upset their entire way of life. They are completely okay with everything going on, losing their memories and the cloud. To them, the Endless are probably as real as anyone else. Even the people of Yasulani were willing to take part in this new way of life. Namika chose to wear a regulator. Nobody in Alexandria was forced to wear one. They likely wouldn't be too happy to learn about the needing to invade places to secure more soul energy. The logistics will be an issue, but they do not mind the mechanics of the nebulous cloud their memories get taken to. There's so much to discuss here of the many possible ideas these places represent. Sphine will do anything to protect her people, the exact same as Wuklamot. The culture of Alexandria is similar to that of the Yakui, yet takes things a bit further. Living memory ends up drawing a line and creates a discussion. At what point is it respecting culture, and when does it become perpetuating evil? They could accept the use of souls, even if we might feel it's improper or such. They all seem willing to take part. They choose to wear regulators even if we wouldn't. Living memory though, killing people to maintain the memory of others? That much even Alexandria would probably agree is evil. Or maybe they won't. What is the line in every other possible case? 
real or imagined, where is respecting culture too big of an ask to be reasonable? Obviously, war crimes is well past the line. An opt-in part of the culture is before the line since it's not forced. Somewhere between these two things, far away from the war crimes part, is a blurry line. Would Alexandria actually be over the line with Sveen's colonial aspects? Living memory, meanwhile, seems to be not just the Yaqui ideal, but an outright bastardization of heaven. Rather than God, Sveen assures that everyone will live on in the cloud. Happy forever, never with strife. An eternity of living on in bliss. This too is a reading I agree with. This one with personal experience. I grew up in a Catholic church, actually. Baptized and spent the first half of my life being forced to go every week. I'm very confidently atheist, but I have an extremely long history of church life. I'll also say every church is different, down to even the priests. I've seen both the platonic ideal of a priest, and know the absolute most evil people who became one. A feeling I constantly had when it came to talk of heaven itself, was that it was somehow supposed to be something that made you grieve less. Sometimes even worded in a way that felt like you wouldn't need to feel grief. Passing to heaven would be a glorious thing. You're with God now, that's good. All pain, suffering, so on, that's gone. Is heaven not just the golden city of living memory? Well, I'm not sure God would install his own amusement park. He sounds way too boring for that. Now Satan down in hell, hell yeah dude, that's where the fun stuff is. Point is though, it's literally called the cloud. Most depictions of heavens are of a cloudy paradise. So your family members living on with God, your memories in the cloud are what's keeping them alive. It's a way to process grief that mirrors a real life experience, a culture we have in real life. There are so many discussions you can have with just this reading. So many other ways to read it too. There's a lot to discuss, and it's a shame so many people seem to only be caught up in the surface layers of a singular character. Which speaking of surface layers, we have Zeral Ja. He's not the only one to experience it, but he's the one that most represents the themes of expectation and the burden that puts on you. All four claimants experience this to an insane degree. It's a major part of their characters. But for all the talk of giving other characters more screen time, people seem to ignore what is already there for Zeralja. Zeralja is a child who, by all accounts, should not exist. We do not know of his mother, only that Galul Jaja should not have had a son. Given Galul Jaja's other children are also adopted, it would be no thing to just say Zeralja is adopted. Yet they don't. He's the miracle. Appointed captain of the guard, the one people seem to think is most likely to become the next Dawn Servant. The expectations on him are crushing him. Even before his full fall to evil, he's constantly shown to have ambitions and dark thoughts toward his own family. Constantly saying he must prove the miracle. Like if you can't tell he is burdened, I... really? He has to prove he truly is as special as everyone is saying he is. There's some clear resentment against his father. Killing him isn't just a matter of proving his strength, but releasing all the grief built up over a lifetime. The complex emotions of fatherhood, of family itself, he holds as he dies did not come out of nowhere. I will say though, I do wish they hadn't been so subtle about it, even if really it isn't subtle at all. Basically, every time he speaks of family, it's just, grr, I hate family. How he speaks of himself and how others speak of him say far more toward why he has his attitude toward family. There's still a lot they leave to the viewer to interpret on their own. I would have liked to hear more from Zeralja directly. He is the character most drowned in misery. He doesn't just hate his family for no reason, he has plenty of reasons. There's a lot that can be said here on how family can cause more harm than they think. Similar to how I felt with Aranville, Galul Jaja is pretty blatantly meant to be the most loving and awesome father. He cares enough to create a rite of succession that doesn't just test them, but aim to make them all better people. Yet the expectations put on Zeralja just completely ruined him. It's an experience I think would be better left as text rather than subtext. Finally, let's talk Bakul Jaja and how he is both the best and really messily handled. 
The cool Jaja -Ja is awesome, and deep down a good guy who is also ruined by the toxicity of expectation. His father is a lot less loving. His expectations are pretty openly a lot less gentle. He's called a failure by Zareel Ja, and how he's going to replace his own son. Yikes, right? Between outright intentional abuse and the corpses of all the other blessed siblings, he has impossibly high expectations to fulfill, especially the expectations of himself. The dead cannot speak, nor could they have any expectations of him, yet he carries their burden. He wants Mamuk's eugenics to stop. He has to win. He has to prove himself superior to save Mamuk from itself. When they can leave the forest, it will end. Oh, well, that part doesn't make sense. Well, maybe it does, but you have to make a few assumptions. We do know for a fact that Bakul Jaja is a bit afraid of us. He knows how ultra-powerful we are just from a look. But does he think we're kill Valigarmanda tough? That all of us can come together to kill it? He does kind of seem to feel Valigarmanda is just a nuisance, rather than something to really be afraid of. Is this the bravado of being blessed siblings? He does actually think the other claimants are strong. There's ways to explain away the plot hole, but it probably is just a plot hole. Freeing Valigarmanda just as likely would burn Mamuk as it is anywhere else. It only makes sense if he knows we're going to beat it, but that seems too subtle of the intent. There's also the weird ambivalence in Ikbrash. Sure, he didn't attack one of the electors, but he did put all of Tural into absolute danger. They're lucky we were able to kill it. This should realistically be enough for him to be disqualified. I guess because he wasn't told it would disqualify him, it doesn't? A really, really weird bit though, is people using the elector kidnapping as an example of this. The elector was kidnapped and nobody knew. How is he going to disqualify Bakul Jaja? You're disqualified! Gets his head chopped off. Oh no, this corpse disqualified me, what am I to do? Then after the battle, he lost to Wook Lamott. There is no hope of winning now. What does it matter if he's disqualified at this point? It's over. My hope is the patch content really addresses his face turn, how he's trying to be better, but he still needs to face consequences for his mistakes. Which, by the way, this is something Wook Lamott herself says he needs to do. He isn't just outright forgiven. The game doesn't really show that though, and it really needs to be something we go over. Then there's also the weirdness with Mamuk. It's pretty much accepted things resolve too quickly here, especially when you compare it to how people treat Wook Lamont. Bigots aren't going to just stop being bigoted. Even if you prove them wrong or give them a better way, they're gonna still be loudly evil, openly, blatantly, intentionally evil, and stupid since bigots are stupid. Mamuk and Ikbrash both still hate each other despite the war being long over. There's still hatred on both sides. Mamuk is in so deep with Blessed Siblings, and they believe only Blessed Siblings can succeed. Blessed Siblings united to Rawl, only Blessed Siblings can continue to rule. All others, including themselves, are inferior. History has proven them right, ignoring all virtuous intent from Galul Jaja that this is the way things have to be. Ignores the truth, the details, and stay insistent on this path. I can't really see, here, have some seeds that grow food, making them suddenly stop doing awful things. They're in too deep. Especially when you see what their reason is for not leaving Mamuk when Galul Jaja came to power. They were afraid of outsiders. Afraid of outsiders and changing their ways. Sure, they don't have to leave now because they have new food available. That doesn't stop the root of the problem, which also gets solved. You can find the Autark during the Succession Celebration, and he says more of Mamuk is looking to move to Toliolol. Things are moving too fast for this to make any sense. People have been complaining about the slow pace of the first half, and ignoring Shaloni, but Mamuk is nothing but speed. I don't get blaming Wook Lamott for this either, when she doesn't actually solve the issues herself, orange cat-brained as she is, and it's just not making sense to begin with. 
she didn't respect the culture more than Kona did, and even if their reason for staying in Mamuk was their culture, a lot of them leave anyway. The eugenics bit isn't exactly culture, so even if they're trying to preempt the whole respecting Alexandria's culture thing, it's just completely lost. Regardless of our opinions of this or that part of the story, there seems to be two things people agree on. That the cultural representation of the expansion is fantastic, and that hard tacos are a sin that must be destroyed. But no, really, I asked on Twitter how people felt about things. There was only one other answer, and that is Brazilians wish there was more Brazil. But even some of them were quick to point out the foliage or creatures. Everyone is so extremely happy with how it was handled. Hell, even Shaloni has its fans of, This reminds me of back home. It even got me. For people on, I think it's Windows 10 or something, I don't know, they all suck these days. But the point is that upon turning on your PC, you get a real life picture. Recently, as of writing this, it's been a specific new picture. So the first time I turned on my PC, I got this picture as I went to get onto my main user. And my first thought was, huh, why is Urkel Pacha on my screen? It wasn't for a good five minutes that my brain finally went, wait, that's just Peru. The reaction to the expansion's locations are overwhelmingly positive. When the only criticism I'm seeing is tacos, that's a near perfect score. Plus, that I don't even think is really a thing to do with culture. That's this community is really bad when it comes to memes and jokes and just letting things die. For years and years, the Ultima theme has been big fat tacos. So giving Graha a taco and putting tacos as a major focus of Tarali cuisine? Yeah, that makes sense. And while the pibil we made in the story is a real recipe in real life, it was likely chosen because, look guys, tacos. So being upset that they are focusing on such a small part of Latin American food? Yeah, understandable. But it feels to me like a misguided pandering to the crowd. The real shame of this is how much food matters in the course of the story. Food is used as a major bridge to lead toward understanding. From ending the war in Yachtel, to people's reactions to newcomers trying food in both Solution 9 and Living Memory, food plays a constant important role in the story. So boiling it down to just tacos, because this fanbase is really stupid when it comes to jokes, is a shame. At the very least, the Pibil very much ties into the area design too, truly combining both halves of the zone. Regardless, the quality and accuracy of the representation absolutely is for the better. The game feels so much more alive when it's faithful, more real. If this is the kind of thing we can get in Dawn Trail, the future expansions are going to be amazing as well. Mirror City is going to kick ass, or at least that is my hope. What definitely kicks ass right now is the gameplay of Dawn Trail. It's not perfect, of course. Dark Knight feels a bit more awkward with Blood Weapon. Bard exists. But we have awesome changes like Black Mage and extremely interesting new jobs like Pictomancer. Dungeons feel fresh with many bosses being challenging or at the least throwing tons of AoEs at you for you to have to truly engage with the fight. The new 8-player raids actually feel dangerous and able to be wiped too. Something you really couldn't do in most Pandemonium raids. Plus Savage is so very fun. People are upset that the DPS check is super easy, but for those of us stuck in Party Finder, that's a really nice bonus. My week 2 Honeybee Lovely Clear couldn't have been any closer. She finished her Enrage cast. People were taking damage. I could not imagine doing this fight with a harder DPS check. It's so bad, especially Alarms. Other than her, the raid tier is just extremely fun. I don't need it to be brutally difficult, painful to complete beyond what Party Finder is putting me through. I want to have fun. Difficulty is fun, yeah. But there's more than one level of difficulty. Can you really say Black Cat is less fun than Eric Savage? A fight people clowned on constantly? A lot of Pandemonium fights I purely didn't like, despite them being properly difficult and tight DPS-wise. Yet here these low DPS required fights I'm having far more fun with. The design of the fights is just really cool. Diving in and out of the boss hitboxes with a fun pace, people are getting their melee downtime and getting around this downtime is part of the fun, despite the DPS check being far easier. Some of these mechanics are just really cool and really fun. Like my favorite mechanic of the entire tier is probably the bomb towers in 3. It's a very simple mechanic overall, but it's just so unique and so fun. Getting knocked about to each tower to then get knocked behind the boss 
It's very quick, doesn't overstay its welcome, and even gets a surprise return at the end of the fight. But also we have a mechanic like Witch Hunt. It's very simply boss-scented AoE and donut AoE alternating with close and far baits alternating. In theory, it's a super simple, super easy mechanic, but the specific movements and positioning change with every pull. Even with downtime, it's just fun to perform it. I'm also super glad that we didn't get some dumb door boss again. I was expecting it with how the normal fight ends, but no. We have an entire playable transition phase as the music picks up. She's so desperate to win, and it really sells it in the moment. Sunrise Sabbath is another bad mechanic because I'm tired of being shot, but hey, that's okay. We're going to skip that mechanic with more DPS. I'm very much looking forward to more content and more fun. I want to see what other fights we'll get, what other kinds of active transitions we can get, and maybe we're going to get another Ivalice quality 24-man raid? Back when those weren't severely outgeared, they were so fun. This is why FF12 is one of the best, because it has one of the best raids. The fact we are seeing people complaining about difficulty being too high is a good thing, because these are the kinds of people outing themselves as people who never paid attention to the gameplay to begin with. Now, I'm not talking about stuff like how apparently easy difficulty in some solo duties was actually easier than very easy. The people complaining about that have bigger issues than the people generally complaining about the difficulty. Now, I'm talking about the kind of people that did the gear exploit for Alliance Roulette. People who were trying to avoid playing the game. Even the near raids have been outgeared and power creeped into a ditch. The bosses die way faster than they did on content, even the final raid. Yet with how fast they die now, people are complaining they take too long. Do you realize how long an alliance raid usually took? Are you so brain rotted by Crystal Tower being objectively broken for the last 8 years that you think barely longer than a dungeon run is typical? No! A typical alliance raid was taking twice the length of a dungeon! Don't be surprised if the new ones take long too, or maybe even take an hour because wipes might happen. I can guarantee we're going to see complaints about it. They take too long, too much HP, too hard. No, this is what an alliance raid is meant to be. I can count on it. I'm all in on the direction they are going. I'd also like to talk about the gameplay of the main story. Because there's going to be a number of comments that say, speak to Wook Lamott and nothing else. If you manage to hear this part and you make one of those comments, congrats, you're an idiot. Because now I'd like to take you through Endwalker's story gameplay. Are you ready? Speak with Grahatia. With Kryl. With Kryl in the main hall. Speak with Alice. Speak with Last Stand Customer. Speak with Dickon. Speak with Alice. Speak with Alice again. Speak with Arinville. Speak with Alphano. Speak with the Arcane Custodian. Speak with Yishtola. Speak with people outside the Arcane. Speak with Alphano. Speak with Alphano. Speak with Yishtola. Speak with Alphano. Speak with Alphano. With Alice. Speak with Emelian. With Alphano. Speak with Kryl. Speak with Kazal. Speak with Matsya. Speak with Maruna. Speak with Mazama. Speak with Nadana. Speak with Nadana again. Speak with Nadana again. With Nadana. Speak with Nadana again. 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 Speak Alice, speak with Alice, speak with Alice again. Speak with, speak with Alice, speak with Kryl, speak with Ojika, speak with Graha, speak with Raulan, speak with Yustola, speak with Alphano, speak with Amanalee, speak with Alice, speak with the girl in green, speak with Alphano, speak with a burly tapper, speak with Alice, speak with Alice, speak with Alice, speak with Alice again, speak with Alice, speak with Eulis, speak with Eulis, speak with Eulis, speak with Eulis again, speak with Eulis yet again, speak with Alphano, speak with Eulis, speak with Alphano, speak with Eulis, 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 speak with Snappy Lop, Snappy Lop, Red again. Speak with Living Way, Cooking Way, Living Way. Speak with the Restless Lop, Jubilant Lop, Speak with Living Way, Fidgeting Lop, Red. Growing Way, Growing Way again. Speak with Growing Way, Growing Way again. Growing Way. Speak with Orion J. 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 Speak with Medion, with Medion, with Memnon, with your with Hermes, with Hermes, with Hermes again, with Hermes, with Hermes again, with Medion, with Medion, with Medion, with Medion, with Doro, with Hermes, with Emmett Self, with Vanar, with Vanar again, with Vanar, more, with Ismen, with Vanar, with Vanar, with Vanar, with the Prepatea, Artea, Archivist, with the approachable, unheard, observed, with Vanar, with Vanar, with Vanar, with Vanar again, with Hythel Day, with Hythel Day, with Hermes, with Emmett Self, with Vanar, with Vanar, with Vanar, with Orion Jet, the Rostra Stewart, with Alphano, with Alice, with Singing Way, with Growing Way, with Orion Jet, with Singing Way, with Cooking Way, with Jebkin, with Jebkin, with Cooking Way, with Theopold, with Theopold, with Grahak, with Cooking Way, with Cooking Way, with Cooking Way, with Cooking Way, with Cooking
Speak with Alpha with Fortune with Clarelly with Fortune with Fortune with Fortune with Alpha with Tata with Farsu with Cry with Bank with you stole with Alice with Alpha with OG with Alpha with Alpha with Stinny with Alice with the Brief Dragon with Orion with Alice with Cock with Cock with Cock with you stole with Alpha with Graha with Graha with Graha with Graha with Alpha with Graha with Alpha with Alpha with Alice with Alpha and that's just the base game story. Did you play the same fucking game I did? People have said it over and over that this is somehow only a thing with a Realm Reborn or now with a Dawn Trail. No, this is all of Final Fantasy XIV. This is how the main story has always been formatted. You have to absolutely not be paying attention to think this is a unique issue. The only difference is that it's a character you don't like. The reality is that even your darling Heaven's Ward plays exactly like this. You spend six full quests looking for Hilda in the broom, running down into the broom, back to the bar, back into the broom, back into the bar, back down to the broom. The only reason I can't do what I just did for Endwalker is that back then they would write multiple paragraphs in the journal for every quest. Even when the paragraphs say, you've spent an hour running in circles and are no closer to finding Hilda. Walking to a point and talking to an NPC is the story experience. Sometimes you battle extremely easy, unthreatening enemies. You're biding your time until the solo duties and dungeons. Pretending this is some new problem is absolutely intentionally unfair criticism. It's not like I'm even saying the criticism is in itself wrong, that they shouldn't try to make the story more engaging than a very slightly interactive visual novel between duties. I absolutely agree, they should. I actually like the stealth missions when they're not overused at least. I would like to see more unique stuff, more quest types. I want the game to be better. But no matter what, I don't expect the main story to be all that engaging from a gameplay aspect outside of duties. No matter how many quest types we get, I've taken the story gameplay for what it is, simple and nothing earth shattering. It being a way for you to get your bearings as a new player in A Realm Reborn, the nothing intense once you develop even a little bit of experience for the average player. Gotta wait for the next duty to be challenged, if you even choose to be. Part of that is also just... logistics? I remember the red chocobos of the Evil East Raid unlock. Do you know what was also extremely easy and not that dangerous? The red chocobos of the Evil East Raid unlock. The reason you might remember dying a lot there is that 50 people all doing it at once meant 100 chocobos all running around at once. That's not difficult enemies, that's a flood of too many of them where you can't even see most of the AoEs. Sure, some crazy overworld objective would be super fun and cool once the mass of players is gone, and maybe they should design based on that context. But what about day one? What happens day one? Is it simply unplayable? Or is it Raubon's wall all over again? Which keep in mind how early into the story the Galul Jaja fight is. Raubon's wall is well and truly dead. Regardless, it's another example of criticism being unevenly applied in the service of being intentionally cruel over not liking a character. It's a shame that this kind of criticism could have been used for some benefit if they actually cared about the game. It's pretty clear nobody who is making it does, or they wouldn't be blaming Wuklamot. Finally though, I'd like to talk about jobs and job changes, because there's a lot of genuine confusion around Viper. I don't mean the people confused about how to play it, but all of us confused on why they changed it. I have seen two reactions to the Viper changes. People confused on why they changed it at all, and people who say the debuff management was so easy and free, which if it was so easy, why get rid of it? If nothing else, it's an objectively bad change for one reason. The buff cap. Viper is now one step closer to hitting the buff cap on a regular basis. This is still an issue, and with ultimate around the corner, I worry how things are going to be with nearly every job having all these new buffs. This leads to a lot of questions on where the dev team is willing to stick to design decisions. Healers have been asking for more complex rotations and such for years. Sage's new AoE dot was about to be a tiny but real DPS increase on single target. They immediately removed it for launch. The DPS changes they did get are all on the 2 minute cooldown. They removed damage and gap closes on the busier tanks so they have more room for weaving defensives. Summoner isn't allowed to develop at all. Black Mage feels better than ever, but mains are unhappy about this being kept. Monk became a 2-3-4 ratio for like a month before they reverted it to 2-2-3. Viper has its debuff removed so there's little to no management. 
So, what's the line here? What is the line that they're willing to stick to their design decisions? And where are they willing to cave? Black Mage is a job with years and years of history. Viper is brand new, so people haven't had time to adjust to its specific playstyle. Monk is a job that has had a lot of reworks, and already has seen another rework after the Endwalker one. The reasonings they give with patches often don't even make sense. We've received feedback that Viper's unique combo system and the managing of its combo roots have proven relatively difficult to handle compared to other melee DPS jobs. The combo roots have not been changed! Dreadfangs was used less than it is now. If anything, it did the opposite of making it easier from a casual perspective. The things people seem to be upset about most are the things that stick. Things that don't make sense to change and don't even seem that complained about get changed. But then the monk changes did half get reverted? So like, I really don't get what the line is. What are they willing to stick to? From what I've heard other people say, from reading interviews I haven't seen, panels at cons or such, the dev team went back on Viper of their own decision. After all that time developing it, why? We do not have a proper given reason that makes sense. I get we're not going to get the debuff back, and I'm glad they try to communicate why they're changing stuff at all, but it's such a non-answer in this case. So in a way, I do also worry they won't continue down the path they're on. Super fun fights that are a challenge. Some people have complained it's too hard even though it's not. How is feedback being taken? Much like how it's unfair to unevenly criticize in a way that's always been true, it's confusing with how they seem to unevenly listen to feedback. I feel a lot of Dragoon players were vocally against Dragoon being too busy, and that's why they didn't rework in a way to reduce how busy it is. But I can't know for sure they listened, or if they just went back on it on their own. I try to remain positive. I play this game because I have fun, because I enjoy it. So I'm going to continue to hope for the best. Let's round out my thoughts on the expansion, though. I was saving a very specific topic for last, and otherwise just letting things flow as I felt them. Obviously, I haven't covered every topic, maybe not even half of all possible topics, but I have had some specific thoughts on Living Memory I wanted to end on. When we get to Living Memory, Wook Lamott tries one last time to reason with Sphine. This isn't a mistake, or a flaw, or bad writing. This is her trying to appeal to the conscience Sphine herself admits she has. A conscience that makes her unable to truly commit the evil plan she is bent on. As we see with Kafkiwa, the Endless are far more than AI. The memories sustaining them are so pure, so accurate to the person that they are of, that Kafkiwa's adventurous spirit led her to be able to escape living memory with one of the terminal bots. So Sphine is so true to the original Sphine, the original queen, despite her creators giving her the task to keep her people alive. A directive she has no choice but to follow, and a personality that could never commit these awful crimes. Which side truly wins out? Which side's grief is truly stronger? Apparently, Sveen wins. Sveen has kept the directive in check to the point that she needs to delete the personality in order to go through with dimensional fusion. Hell, after the fight, Sveen basically tells us as such. She truly did want to find another way, but she had no choice. From here, she is left with but one final ask. Remember. Remember us. Remember that we once lived. People seem to really hate that this is so similar to the Ashians. Which, yeah, it's a bit too similar. But I think this really proves the stop giving everyone tragic backstories thing. There are so many ways to make a tragic backstory that differs, but eventually they start to all feel the same. And when they seem similar at all, people immediately ignore how different they are. Living Memory's differences are in the name. Living Memory. It uses the memory of the people who were lost to create beings so extremely real, you can't tell them apart. Amarat is simply Emmett casting glamours over the actual lost city of Amarat. After beating Emmett, you can see the ruins for what they truly look like. Every person in Amarat is just a shade of Emmett's memories alone. With him gone, eventually the glamours will also fade. Amara is created in the memory of what he lost. It represents his grief at losing what once was. 
but it doesn't say anything more than that. It's a window into the Ancients and Emmet's past. It doesn't linger on the grief. The story section here is actually very short even. It's the back half of the Tempest as a whole. Going through the final moments of the story, there's a lot of complex emotions shown. Emmet's hatred and anger, his sorrow and grief, his hesitations. Grief is there, but it's not the sole focus. If there is to be a small focus in an area meant to be a huge reveal, it's Emmet himself. Amarat is about Emmet Selk, not about grief as a concept. Living memory is an area all about grief. Everyone is given their time to process their own. Graha is given a moment to look back on his, reprocess it. He had a hundred years as the Exarch to grieve, process, and move forward while asking you, someone he'd lost in the timeline he comes from, about how you've processed yours. Perhaps you think of Harshafont, or perhaps something more real comes to your mind. Look, Lamont is given time to properly say goodbye to Namika, her mother. Kryle is given time to meet and grieve for her parents. Orinville is forced to move through the grief with his mother, all accompanied with one good day. One last day to spend time together, so the final memories of these people is a good one. Sveen was too selfish and could not bear to lose them. She wanted more than just one good day to truly say goodbye. All these people, she wished to keep them alive. But they're not people, they're AI. Just AI using memories stolen from other people. We're here to shut them all down. It's just code, right? Right? It's a take I've seen from even people I know are having genuine discussions. One I can't agree with, because the entire zone's events and dialogue all agree that it's not so simple. At the start, everyone is completely against turning off the terminals and erasing the endless. The experiences they have with these AI versions are real. Even Orinville, the realist of the group, struggles to process his grief and simply turn off the final terminal. Living memory is alive. It's living memory. So real that we hesitate to do the inevitable. All things die, and we spent all of Endwalker talking about this. Yet now we hesitate. If it's so simple a task, why is it difficult for these characters? It's very simple, very easy to just say AI can't ever actually be alive. Especially an AI of a person who was alive and is most certainly now dead. Yet they act so real, you can't tell the difference. There are so many ethical concerns here on killing something that seems real. After all, these actually are the real memories of these people. There's also the ethical concerns of creating something like this. The form they take in living memory is the time they were happiest in life. So why are there so many children? Sveen was the first Endless. So did she force children into becoming Endless? Or are these people who were so unhappy in life that they never experienced happier days after childhood. Both options are awful to think about, both in the horribleness of what they must have gone through and that they were forced to be endless. Innocent children forced into this. Innocent children so real, you can't tell the difference. Innocent children, you are going to delete. Are you sure it's so easy now? The endless did not ask for this. Maybe some of them did, clued into it ahead of time, but as far as we saw, people only know of a nebulous cloud. So even if their memories are happy in the Golden City, they didn't get to choose this. They can do things they were unable to in life, make up for lost time or lost loves. They do not have to feel grief. They can change though. And they can feel grief too if Sveen is any indication. They can act on feelings they never did in life. That couple in Canal Town is one that never existed in life. Yet in death, they come together and start anew. Kafkiwa left living memory and is even strong enough to resist Sveen. Try to stop Sveen. Sveen herself is stuck between her programming and her memories. Kafkiwa is able to so easily say they're just facsimiles, but how they act, how they feel, and how much emotion comes into play? Their just AI seems very dismissive. No matter what, they need to be deleted. No matter what, their existence does not supersede the existence of the currently living. 
no matter what, maintaining living memory is unsustainable, so we might as well turn it off now. But can you? Maybe because they're strangers. What if you had family here? Right here, right now in real life, we have people trying to do exactly this. Trying to create facsimiles of people who never gave their permission and likely wouldn't to begin with. Voice actors, artists, and so many others are fighting right now because they don't want this. They don't want to invade the source to get the ever-growing, ever-unsustainable energy requirements this stuff takes. While tech bro Sphine is forcing people to participate against their will, they waste more and more. They seek to create more endless against the people's will. Or Sphine isn't some dirty capitalist using AI to make money. Of course not. All of this is emotion. Sphine merely refuses to grieve for those she has lost. These people have a far less emotional stake in it, caring only for the money they can make off of making endless out of people who never asked. What happens if things are able to go far enough to replicate the average person? What happens if you have family uploaded? You'll be able to speak to them again, hear them respond with their voice. We are unlikely to ever get to the point of replicating the person themselves, but the voice will be enough. You buried that family long ago, but now a machine is able to respond just like they would. Will you be able to delete your family for the good of the world? The reality of it all is coming at us fast. A living memory in the hands of profiteers is coming at us fast. It's one thing to be able to look back on memories and the history a person has made. It's another to use their voice to say things they never said. They will never be able to say on their own. Leveraging people's grief is something I can see happening. I can help you say goodbye, but in exchange I get to own their voice forever. Grief makes us do crazy things. Money makes us do evil. And evil will gladly exploit our grief. The only Golden City we'll get in real life is the mansions these scumbags will buy. There's a lot of things to speak of with living memory, but the loudest is the most silent. Before turning off a terminal, the game asks every time if you are ready that there is no going back. When everything has concluded, the zone remains, but now it's dark. It's eerie and quiet. It's the reverse of Ultima Thule. Where that was a build-up, this is a shutdown. The music fades in and out, what little remains barely hanging on. There's many ways this can be read, but unlike with ways of reading the zone to be like heaven or such, I do not wish to share my vision. Not for fear or shame, but because to me, What's most powerful about what Don Trail did as a story is how you read this right here. Don Trail is the antithesis of Endwalker. We've been conditioned for the last 10 years to wallow in misery. Bad things happen over and over. Main themes telling of desperation over and over. We succeed and come out the other side alive, sure. The final moments are happy and triumphant, but how much suffering was needed to get to that point? Things aren't always awful. There's a tomorrow, a new beginning, a trail toward a new dawn. The scars of what we go through often define who we are, what we believe. But this isn't a universal truth, or the only truth. The happy moments are equally important. The things that ease our burdens, that make us smile. They make us who we are and what we want to do just as much. Eventually the suffering fades and we accept what has happened. We hurt, we grieve, we try to move forward and grasp a better tomorrow. A better tomorrow for the game comes from properly criticizing the expansion's faults and pointing out what was done right. Not wasting time on Gamergate grifters who don't even play the game. People here to be angry and outright evil. People need to be more like Otis and less like Zeralja. Dawn Trail is the opposite of Endwalker down to even its credits theme. The themes of flow and footfalls are emotional, deeply compelling for their own reasons. Yet they share the theme of endings, not being afraid of them. No matter how painful it may get, we mustn't be afraid to forge ahead. 
Don Trail instead takes a stand, confidently proclaims for all to hear that, no matter what, no matter how dark things have gotten, we'll get. We will be fine. Together, we can find a way. We will grieve, but there is light on the other side of the tunnel. That a smile better suits a hero. And I just think that's beautiful.